this is an IPython notebook, which is the way in which we decide that it's best to interface with the PyEMA software, okay? So this is how you're going to be looking at your data. This is how most of the people that work in our group spend our day like, looking at something like this, where the code of Python has been broken up into little units called cells, okay? That work independently from one another and that are very, feel, feel very natural if you are programming because they encapsulate little concepts. Like, I'm going to load my data in this cell. I'm going to look at my data in this other cell. I'm going to do this other thing between these two cells, okay? And your notebooks are always gonna be starting with a line like this, import Payama, which is the way that we load our code into the workspace, okay? This other statement here just uh, is a check that we put there so that everyone sees that they should be running a Payama 2.3 point something version. Point 0.2 or point 0.1 will work on this notebook, okay? You can execute the code in the cell by clicking at the play button that's here, okay? Now I executed this cell, which is just documentation, so nothing happened, okay? This is another command that will just load into the workspace some plotting and some numeric routines. Uh, right now you're wondering what does all of this have to do with molecular dynamics? Well, we are answering that question in this cell, okay? The way that PyEMA interacts with molecular dynamics, the entry point from the data that has been generated by a software like Gromax, ASMD, Amber, is through the coordinates package, which we are loading in this cell with the import coordinates, and we're giving it a shorter name, just core, okay? And we're also importing a function called shortcut, uh, shortcuts, we don't really need to care about that. So, I uh, believe everybody is familiar with this trajectory. This is the one millisecond DE Shaw DPTI trajectory. Frank was mentioning this trajectory in his talk. And we are representing this trajectory, as I am hoping all of you are familiar with, through a pair of a topology file containing information about the structure, atom types, residue indices, okay, PDB, and the actual trajectory, which is stored in an XTC, okay? So for now, this is like the natural language of molecular dynamics, okay? And the first level of abstraction happens in the next cell. So this, sorry, because I didn't execute this cell because I was explaining it to you. Okay, don't worry if it's not working on your computers. You can look at the screen. You can look at your computers later. You will be okay. But if you understand this object, you have understood already. 80% of what it is to understand about what it is that we do in Payema, okay? We have now contained the topology information, okay, the actual molecule in a featureizer object, okay? And we have done so <coughs> with this method featureizer, okay? Now this featureizer object is an abstract representation of this topology allowing us to interact and derive quantities from that topology. Okay, for example, by just saying feature dot add all, I am adding all of the coordinates of this topology to my featureizer. That means that from this moment on, I am representing my trajectory as the Cartesian coordinates of the C alpha atoms, because this is a C alpha trajectory. I could have chosen to add another type Okay, of feature. This is just the way that I look. I could add angles, torsions, chi one angles, contacts, dihedrals, distances, whatever. Okay. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I just have decided to add all of the features. And by the way, you just saw the nice autocomplete function that the IPython notebook interface gives us, so that it's easier to learn what these abstract objects called classes are offering to us. Okay. Good. Another very, very practical method of this class feature is the describe method, which will just produce a string representation 
of what it is that we are abstracting our MD data to. Okay, so I have just chosen here to bring the first 20 uh, features, which are just Cartesian indices. Okay, so atom of the arginine number one, C alpha, has the atom index zero, X, Y, Z, the first atom, X, Y, Z, the second atom, X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. Okay? Please, at this moment, notice that the only information, and this is important, the only information that I have abstracted so far is topology, okay? There is no dynamical data yet loaded into the node. I am just using the information about which atom is connected to what other atom and has the name C alpha or C beta or whatever to create a representation of that molecule. But it's still, in a sense, empty, OK? Question? No. I mean, yes, but you wouldn't want to do that. OK? Good. Why did I emphasize this separation between topology and trajectory data? Because for that, we have another type of object, okay? another class in the coordinate package, which is called the source object. Okay? And the source object is the combination of the topology and feature information plus the dynamic data. Okay? I could just take, OK, this is the PDB of BPTI. Please abstract it to its Cartesian coordinates and now connect it with the kinetic data, okay? And this is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm saying create a source object. Martin, can you please? Or just, no, because you're too close. Okay, here's where the, dinet the kinetical data enters in the workspace. And it is aware of the features. So we just, okay, load that into the source object. And the source object also has methods that informs us of its properties, like the trajectory length, okay? Approximately 100,000 frames. This is the one millisecond trajectory. And the, num the number of dimensions, okay? So I was saying that I was featurizing to the Cartesian positions of the C alpha atoms, okay? So this is three times the number of C alpha atoms that I have in my molecule. This is a good check that things are going fine, okay? We have 174 because we have 58 atoms, okay? So now we are going to do a transformation of those Cartesian coordinates. It's as if instead of doing PCA on the Cartesian coordinates, which is something that most of the people have done, we're just going to do TICA, which Felix will explain once I finish this very quick presentation and that Frank already introduced, okay? How do I do TICA? Well, there's a method for that in the coordinates package. And what is the input of that method? <coughs> the input of that <coughs> method is the source object, OK? I, I am hoping, I, I am emphasizing this because I want you to have this structure in your mind of what it is we're doing. We're going levels of abstractions up. We're just having an XTC and a PDB, and that, and the PDB we abstract into a featureizer. <coughs> then we take the featureizer and the trajectory data, and then we abstract that into a source object. And then we take that source object and we abstract that into a TICA object, okay? Which is aware of the source object and has some parameters, which we will explain later, okay? This transformation needs to compute some parameters so that you can derive the projection that the transformation actually does to your data. And that is, and that is, okay? So please notice we instantiate the object and just through instantiating it gets parameterized and I can get the output of the object through this method, okay? And now why is out of this very abstracted object that contains information about topology, kinetics, transformation, TICA, we get, again, a very, very non-abstract object, which is just an MPI array, okay, or an MPI array. This Y object is just a vector, and it has all of the methods that an MPI array would have, okay? It's a vector that has 100,000 lines and two columns, okay? And these two columns are my coordinates. Good. 
So if you understood, oh, I'm running this again, sorry. Okay, so I am plotting the two rows of the white object. Okay, I am plotting the first tick and the second tick, and this is my time axis. Okay, I, I hope that you now kind of like close the circle. So we started with an XTC and a PDB that you would have, I don't know, you would have like G RMSD if you were like in a normal prompt, and then you would have opened it up in your XM Grace or whatever visualizing software of choice. And we have done everything in the same workspace, which is the notebook. Okay? And here we are. First coordinate, second coordinate. Incidentally, Frank mentioned this uh, uh, in passing before. The TICA method immediately points you towards the weaknesses of your simulation. The weakness of, of the simulation is that there is only one event mm -hmm. happening. Okay? So they spend a million dollars to create <laughs> one millisecond trajectory and I mean this is an incredible feature. I, I don't want to like talk this down but what I'm saying is uh, because this will happen hopefully to your data if after doing Tika the first time you notice that there is a problem with your data then that's good because you, you know you have noticed that there is a problem early on in your pipeline and you didn't just you know analyze something that wasn't converge or even connect good we're gonna skip this I'm going to skip this, and I am <coughs> going to skip this, I think. And now, again, another familiar object to those of you who know a little bit and who've done some analysis. This is just a free energy surface, okay? It's actually just a histogram, because we don't know if our data is in equilibrium, but if I say free energy surface and I show you this, most of the people have like a good mental anchor to know where they are, okay? So I hope that you see how we started from the same information, arrived at the same information, but in the middle, we have created these very powerful objects that give us a lot of flexibility that I am not showing here because my only purpose now is for you not to be scared of IPython notebooks and PyEMA objects, okay? So I'm hoping everybody can see that this is just the representation of the two blue trajectories that I showed before with two minima that are widely sampled in the second component and then the first component is just spending most of the time here towards the end of the trajectory it comes here and then it goes back right so with a little bit of imagination or very few you see how these two vectors actually integrate to this map okay finally and before we move to the estimation part of the data. Oh yeah, I know what I have this here. This is just so that we see that all of our classes have this very nice autocomplete. I mean, not all, all of the Python classes that have methods like this have a lot of uh, intuitive uh, autocomplete functions that help us see what they are capable of. For example, the coordinate package is capable of clustering <coughs> so that if I just write core.class, it will tell me that there are the possibilities to cluster with k-means, with mini-batch k-means for very large data sets, regular space, or in uniform time, okay? How do I cluster? I just feed this clustering object the data, okay? It does its things. Martin has been very, very <coughs> nice and has built in a progress uh, progression bar for us to know if we have to wait 20 minutes or 20 seconds and this is where the clusters fall okay <coughs> so i asked for clusters that are regularly spaced a minimum distance i oh, know i asked for k means clustering <coughs> so here you see that where the density is higher you get more k means clusters where the density is lower, you spend less clusters. That's what you want your k-means algorithm to do. So everything is working. And this is the starting point for building the transition matrix, or actually trying to build a Markovian transition matrix, uh, which is uh, what the MSM is all about. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Felix. I will talk briefly talk to you about theory, a little bit of theory behind 
Tika, that was just explained to you by Guillermo. So Tika is, as was already mentioned, a method to extract a suitable low dimensional space of reaction coordinates where we can then use clustering techniques and all of the estimation techniques to end up with a Markov state model. Yeah, Tika is a way to approximate slow collective coordinates in an optimal way from some predefined, uh, usually very general set of coordinates. And as I will explain to you in just a minute, Tiger is one specific case of a framework that we have called variational approach to confirmation dynamics, or VAC. What makes a reaction coordinate a good reaction coordinate? We, um, I think the, the general mathematical framework to answer this question is um, based on the theory of the transfer operator. Yeah, if we have, a, we have a stochastic dynamical system described by a Markov process, then the dynamics of this <coughs> system can be described by a transfer operator. The transfer operator basically propagates the state of the system in terms of a probability density <coughs> over time. Yeah, the system at the time zero <coughs> instance is described by some probability density P0, then the transfer operator will forward this density to the corresponding density at time, let's say, tau. Yeah, this is the, what the operator does. In all of the cases we are considering, this operator can be decomposed into spectral components. Uh, it can be decomposed post into, well, if, if it acts on some initial density, then this action can be decomposed in projecting the density onto an eigenfunction, it's called psi i, and the contributions from these eigenfunctions are weighted by the eigenvalues. It is known, or a typical situation, that is that there is a number of dominant eigenvalues, eigenvalues very close to one, and all the other ones decay very quickly. In general, these eigenvalues, all of them can be assumed to decay exponentially with the lag time. That means that there is usually a number of very long-lived processes here in this decomposition, and all others decay very, very quickly and can be ignored. That's why the, go the goal is to determine these dominant eigenfunctions and their corresponding eigenvalues, project the dynamics onto this space, and do a clustering there. As an illustration, let's use this very, very simple one-dimensional model system. You can imagine a small particle fluctuating around in this energy landscape here. And what, what would you expect to happen here? We would expect that most of the time and the particle that the particle will spend most of the time in one of these four minima of the potential energy landscape and only rarely transition across one of these barriers here. This is exactly what happens. And this structure is reflected by the four dominant eigenfunctions of the transfer operator that we can compute but basically analy analytically here. I am showing you the eigenfunctions over here. The first one is not very informative, it is always constant, it's not very interesting. But the other ones possess this typical structure that they are more or less constant on certain regions of the state space. Yeah, so the, the psi 2, the second eigenfunction, is constant on all of the left half and all of the right half. And ex it, it only exchanges its sign across this barrier. And that's the characteristic structure that indicates to us that the slowest transition is exactly the transition <coughs> over this barrier. And in the same way, the next two eigenfunctions encode the next two slowest transitions. So if we were able to find these eigenfunctions from, I don't know, from some representation and project our dynamics onto these functions, then we would have a very good low dimensional representation of the dynamics. And this is what Pika and the variational approach in general are about. Okay, let me go over this and move on to the framework directly. How can, so <coughs> how can we obtain a, uh, an approximation <coughs> to the dominant eigenfunctions? Usually what we do is we, um, we pick some very general and very large set of basis functions. I will call them x of t here. So x is like, for every t, x is like a vector containing the, the value of many different basis functions at time step t, and we can put them all together in a big matrix. And we try to Get, obtain an approximation of this low coordinates, so of this low eigenfunctions, as a linear combination of all of these basis functions. 
that was our model, our library, if you like, and we try to model the slow eigenfunctions from this library. The key um, to, to obtain this representation is the, the variation of principles, which is written down here. It, is, it can be shown that if we select a number, let's call it capital M, of functions, basically, this could now this could be any linear combination from our basis function space here. Yeah? And we compute their time-lagged correlation, yeah? the time-lagged autocorrelation for, this, for all of these capital M functions, and sum them all up. And this is always bounded from above by the sum of the true first M eigenvalues of the transfer <coughs> operator. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm selecting a number of functions, compute the time-lagged correlation or autocorrelation of these functions, sum them all up, and this is bounded from above by the sum of the true first m eigenvalues. And equality holds if we use the exact, the exact eigenfunctions. I should add that um, these functions here have to be orthogonal in some sense. They have to be orthogonal in the sense <coughs> that their instantaneous autocorrelation is um, one if I have the same function in zero otherwise. Yeah, they are orthogonal in, this, in the sense of their autocorrelations are diagonal. Yeah. And this is reflected by the true eigenfunctions as well because they are also orthogonal in this sense. Using this, this variation principle, we, can, we have basically an optima optimality criteria. Yeah. Remember, the goal was to use a basis and extract linear combinations of the spaces that optimally approximate the true eigenfunctions. So now we know what we need to do. Yeah, we need to maximize this sum of time-lagged autocorrelations subject to an orthogonality constraint among all possible linear combinations from our basis set. And that's, that will be the optimal re representation of the slow eigenfunctions, right? That's what we need to do. And if you carry out this optimization problem restricted to our basis, we end up with the eigen eigenvalue problem that already appeared. It already appeared in Frank's talk earlier. Yeah, it turns out that we have to compute an instantaneous um, correlation matrix or covariance matrix yeah, where we compute all the instantaneous cross correlations between our basis functions and also a matrix of time lift correlations over here and then solve this generalized eigenvalue problem. You have to compute it. Um, vectors and eigenvalues that satisfy that C tau applied to the vector equals an eigenvalue times C0 applied to the same vector and extract the first capital M, whatever M is, and we'll talk about this later, um, of these eigenvector eigenvalue pairs. Then the optimal representation of the eigenfunction is given by the linear combination encoded by the eigenvector UI. Okay, and this can be, this is a very general method because you can, the choice of basis functions is basically yours and you can insert whatever <coughs> you like. Yeah, you can use some very raw molecular features like angles or distances and all of them together, but you can also apply nonlinear transformations to all of these features to arrive at the basis set of your choice, whatever seems most appropriate to you, and insert it into, into this method. Yeah, so here's a list which is certainly not exhaustive of all possible choices of basis functions that you can use. <coughs> and we, what we have called Tika and we, is basically one specific choice. Yeah? As your basis set, you would use some coordinate set from your molecular simulation data. Usually we make it mean free, so we subtract the means from, <coughs> all, the basis, from all the coordinates and then just insert it into this method. Yeah? We compute the, the instantaneous correlation matrix, we compute the time length correlation matrix. This is what was happening um, what was happening underneath while Guillermo was ex executing the cell in the notebook. And the eigenvalue problem is assembled and solved. And uh, in the end, the data is projected onto the leading eigenvectors. That will be the Tika projection you have seen in Guillermo's notebook just a few minutes ago. And there, there is a bit of an, an, I would say, ambiguity of naming here. Yeah? What we usually understand 
under the name of Tika is that you extract some raw set of coordinates and insert it into here. But of course, you can also apply some very non-linear non transformation of your choice and insert this method, this data, into the Tika method we have in PyM. Yeah? So there is a bit of ambiguity here. OK. Now, that, now we have a method. And the question that is somehow left to be answered is uh, how, how many features or how many Tika projections do we store? Yeah? So we have an extremely large set of basis functions or coordinates, then it doesn't help us to compute all possible eigenvectors of this generalized eigenvalue problem and store all of them. Yeah? We, the goal was to find a dimension reduction. And the question is how can, we, how can we cut off the number of eigenvectors we keep? And here the framework of so-called kinetic distance or and also the diffusion distance has, a, has proven to be very useful. The, the idea is to um, first perform a scaling of the eigenvectors we have just computed. So imagine we have performed Tika with our basis set, computed the eigenvectors, and now we scale these eigenvectors, these are the psi i's here, by their corresponding eigenvalue. Yeah? Each eigenvector is scaled by its eigenvalue. This provides a new set of um, new set of coordinates. And in this space, it can be shown that like standard Euclidean distance between any two points equals what is called the diffusion distance. The diffusion distance is formally a distance between um, probability densities. So here, x1 and x2 would be any could be any pair of points in your state space. And we look at the, um, the probability density um, of finding the, the particle of the system in some position y after time tau, given that it started in x1. Yeah, so it's basically we start the dynamics deterministically at x1, let the dynamics run <coughs> for time tau, and then look at the distribution of the system. This would be the term here on the left side, p tau of y given x1. The same term appears here, just started from a different initial point, x2, and we compare these two distributions to each other. Yeah, we look at the difference between those two and calculate the distance between these distributions in some suitable mode. It can be shown that if we do this, the scaling of the eigenvectors, then Euclidean distance in this space corresponds to the diffusion distance, that is, the distance between the dynamical distance in the sense between um, between starting the dynamics in one point and another point. And that's a very, very useful feature. Yeah? We can express a very mm -hmm. abstract property, the distance between two probability um, distributions, just as the Euclidean distance between our projected eigenvectors. Yes? But wouldn't that depend on the metric that you that use? On the metric? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does. But it only works for one. It works for this specific one. Yeah, but that this one makes sense because it's the one we usually use and where on which the transfer operator concept is based on. Yeah. And that, and the intuition behind it is, if we have, we, if we can calculate this distance here as a Euclidean distance between standard points, it means that if points are far apart here, then these points are dynamically separated. Yeah, because the resulting distributions are very different. And it, mean, it means that the dynamics it behaves very differently if we started at one point or another, and vice versa. And I should add, of course, that this equality is true if these are the exact eigen functions. Yeah. If they are approximations, there's, of course, an error. But that's, we have to live with this error. OK, let me just show you a brief illustration that this is really, it can be really an advantage. Here's a very simple data set, um, artificial data set, where the slow, the slow transition is, um, along, happens along the y-axis. Yeah? So within each of these clouds here, the dynamics is very fast, and it only rarely exchanges between these two clouds. The two arrows that I hope you can see here are, um, are scaled Tika directions. Yeah? So the First, Tika <coughs> eigenvector points in the right direction. It points in the y direction because that's the slowest process. And the other one mm, points in some other direction. And the, the, as they are scaled by the eigenvalue, 
this direction is very, very short. Yeah? Um, and here you see the difference between Markov state models that were constructed in this two dimensional space. Yeah? So we have projected the dynamics onto, um, onto the space of the first two GCAP coordinates. And in one, in one case, here in the blue case, we did not scale them according to the, the eigenvalue. And for the red case, we did scale. And we see that the implied time scale, that's an, an estimate of the slowest relaxation time scale, converges a lot faster if we, if we include the scale. And why does it work? This, the eigenvalue corresponding to the second direction is very, very small. That means if we scale these two, um, these two directions according to the eigenvalue, then this, the landscape is almost one dimensional. And the clustering focuses on the direction that is really dynamically interesting on this y direction here. In the other case, they are not weighted, and the clustering spreads over a full two dimensional landscape, even though the second direction is not important. Yeah? And this is reflected in the different conversions of implied time scales. This diffusion distance also allows us to define a criteria <coughs> how we can how we can select the number of Tika eigenvectors to keep. For this we define what is called total kinetic variance. We just um, scale up the squared eigenvalues from the Tika <laughs> problem. So we just we just sum them all up. And in this way we measure how much of the kinetic variance, yeah, how much of the um, how, yeah. What, what the contribution of each of the <coughs> eigenvectors to the whole <coughs> kinetic <coughs> distance really is. Yeah? And that's a very, <coughs> that seems to be a very suitable criterion to make a cutoff. We just sum up all of them, and then we look at the fraction of um, yeah, how much kinetic content is contained if we only go up onto, let's say, eigenvector n of all, of all of them. And if, the, if this number here exceeds like 95% of this total kinetic variance, then we make a cutoff. Yeah, we can also select a different cutoff of 90%, and that's the idea. Yeah. Here you see how um, this fraction here, sum of the squared eigenvalues up to position m divided by the total kinetic variance, um, uh, ex increases as a number of the dimensions. I think this is for the VPTI system yeah, that you've previously seen. And if we just go until we reach 95% of the total kinetic variance, we arrive at a suitable cutoff for the number of eigenvectors. I think you have seen, no, you haven't really seen this picture. Here's just a comparison of different methods for the VPTI system, the one that is also in, in the notebook. We compare um, just using projection onto two, the first two Tika eigenvectors in the system, the first six, onto all Tika eigenvectors, and onto the ones selected by the kinetic map with 95% as the cutoff. And we can see, yeah, here's the same picture as we had, as we had on the previous slide. And we see that um, the selection based on the kinetic map seems to be best in the sense that we reach the maximal or highest implied time scale from this estimation. Okay, this is really quick, the last. The last thing we can do is to introduce yet another, um, another metric, I would say, another criterion that can be used, and it's called commute distance. The only problem that remains with the kinetic distance is that it depends on the lag time. Uh, we have to, to pick some lag time in order to perform Tika, and then we use the eigenvalues extracted from the <coughs> eigenvalue problem at this lag time <coughs> to d define the metric and make the cutoff and all the rest. And this can, can be problematic in some cases because eigen the, um, the quality of eigenvalue and time scale estimates depends on the lag time. Mm, so it would be nice to have a, have a metric that does not really depend on the lag time. And the result of this is called the commute distance. The scaling then it's not, ba not based on eigenvectors or eigenvalues, but it's based on implied time scales. So instead of using the eigenvalue, we use the time scale and scale every eigenvector by the square root of the half of the time scale. And it can be shown that if we use this scaling, then Euclidean distance in this, in this space 
corresponds to one half the round trip time between two states. Yeah? So the round trip time would be the sum of the mean first passage, passage times from x position x1 to x2 and back from x2 to x1. So here we in this way we can find a space where Euclidean distance is equal to half of the round trip time, which is also a very useful feature. And in particular, it's independent of the lag times. What can also be shown is, is that this, this metric arises if you integrate the kinetic distance over all possible lag times. OK, just a final example. Again, the same, the same uh, BPTI system. We, we use the same metrics as before, just using two tickle coordinates, six tickle coordinates, all of them. The kinetic map, map at one specific lag time and the commute map, and we see that the commute map adds another, at least a bit of improvement to the time scale estimation. <coughs> okay. These methods, um, these scaling versions, are also part of the TIGA implementation in Payama. They're just given as keywords, kinetic map and commute map. So uh, we, we highly recommend using them if, we do the if you do the dimension reduction. Okay, that's all. Thank you.